Well, hey there, guys, and welcome back. On this week's show, some updates. Well, how many times have you watched a YouTube show and then thought, yeah, okay, buddy, well, it's two years have gone by, or a year, or six months, but really, how do you still like the project, or how do you still like the tool? And that's what we're going to touch on today, as I've compiled a list of older shows that some of you may have questions about. You may be wondering, hey, how did that work out for Kenny? And that's what we're going to do today. Now, I'm not sure if there's going to be a one-part or a two-part. It is an extensive list, so let's just get right to it. Well, one of the first things I thought that I could do an update on was my show on rust removal. And quite some time ago, I did a show demonstrating how to remove rust, surface rust, from your cast iron tabletops. And although my methods have not changed on how to do that, what has changed is what I've used to coat it. And where I used to use this type of a spray, I found that the longevity of that spray wasn't up to my liking. So I've since changed to this stuff, which is Autosol. And Autosol is basically a metal polish that has an agent in it that puts a protective coating on the metal once it's polished. The thing I like about it is that a little goes a long way and it doesn't take much to bring your tools up to a beautiful shine with a beautiful coating. So, while the other spray is quite acceptable, if you don't want to use the Autosol, I have found that I've only used the coating spray now for things like lubrication on the scroll saw and on the jointer for in-between passes on a job where there's lots of jointing to do and you just find that you get too much friction. I find that the spray does a great job in lubricating that surface and allowing the material to slide. So it still has its place in the shop. So update number one, rust removal. I've started using Autosol because I find it lasts a lot longer. Well, it seems like only a short time ago that I showcased the Veritas setup blocks on my show. And these things to this day are still incredible. And it's actually amazing how much I use them in the shop. You wouldn't think that you would use these little blocks of metal to that extent, but I honestly think I use them for almost every single project in one shape or form or another. However, the update to this is that they've added a new addition to these. And let's just head over to the bench and I'll talk to you about them. So the update to the show is not about these sets. What it is, is about Veritas's newest edition of Setup Block, which is a perfect companion to the original sets. And this is basically five setup blocks in one. And you can buy them individually or you can buy them in sets of three. And quite honestly, I think, I think they're fairly reasonable for what you get. And what you have is on this surface, you have one eighth of an inch thick. Then this surface is one quarter. Here is half an inch. This surface is three quarter. And then the width of the entire thing is one inch. And it's a nice little saddle square. You can see how small that is. And you can keep one in your shop apron. You can keep one, you know, with your setup blocks. I got three. I keep one on the bench and I keep one in each of the sets of the blocks. But honestly, it's just a great little addition. And uh, I thought I would just bring it to your guys' attention just in case it was something that was, you know, up your alley. Well, without a doubt and bar none, the most asked about piece of equipment in my shop would be these things. And these are the Incra T rules. Now, these are available in metric and imperial. And when I first put out the review of these, 
I couldn't say enough good things about them and it has been a very long time since I've purchased them and since then I now have four. <laughs> I have the 6 inch, the 12, the 18 and the Protractor and I would not trade them for all the tea in China. Guys, people are saying that these are expensive and you know I can't justify the cost. Try one. Use one once and you'll understand why they are as expensive as what they are. It's because their precision is unbelievable and it makes your layout and marking so much easier. So what is the update to this show on the Inker T rules? The update is that nothing has changed. I haven't been able to find anything negative about these darn things. They have been rock solid since day one and they still continue to be rock solid. And if you are interested in getting yourself one, by all means do, because you will not regret that purchase. So just the update that nothing has changed there. They're still awesome. And I just have so many people asking that I thought I would put it on here so that we can get a link below and have you guys be able to look and get your own. So there you go. The Inker T rule still fantastic in the shop and I wouldn't trade it. So one thing I will say about the Inkra T rules is that you need to decide what type of projects you make in the shop if you're only going to buy one to see which one suits you the most. For me, the 6 inch gets used the absolute most in the shop and the Protractor gets used the least with the 12 inch coming in second and the 18 inch coming in third as far as their usage goes. It's just the way it works for me with the layout and the projects that I do. So think about the projects that you make in your shop and make the decision as to which one will work for you if you only plan on purchasing the one. Well, the next show that I thought could use an update was my show on quarter sheet sandpaper jig. I don't know if you guys remember this one, it was quite some time ago and it was a simple little jig that used an old hacksaw blade and a piece of plywood to allow you to tear off uh, pieces of sandpaper the exact size you need for a quarter sheet sander. So <laughs> what kind of an update could I have here? The only update I would say is that I will be adding another set of lines to this and just make my labels a little more clear. Um, I have a different block sander that takes one sixth of a sheet. So I will add another line or another two lines to this in order to be able to tear those off. But other than that, this jig has proven itself over time as far as ease of use. I used to fold it and crease it and tear it and use the edge of my table saw to tear it off. What a pain in the butt. But honestly, this thing has been fantastic since day one. I'm glad I thought of making it and I'm also glad I brought it on the show. And hopefully you guys will try it for yourself. And you know what? Simple? Yes. Effective? <laughs> Damn straight. Well, quite some time ago on the show, I demonstrated and showed you how to make one of these. And that would be a wooden letter opener. And honestly, guys, there isn't much of an update to this one other than to bring it to the attention of new subscribers that this project is there because it is awesome. It has been forever since I made these and I have made a kajillion of them and given them away as gifts. Uh, here and there, you know, Christmas, birthdays, and just for the heck of it. And guys, I have to tell you, I've got one that lives in my desk drawer and it gets used constantly. In a day of electronics, of email and that sort of thing, how many letters do we actually get? And it's nice to preserve some old things. And one of those old things is a letter opener. 
It was one of the staples of a desk set years ago with a blotter and a pen holder and of course that letter opener. They were the staples and the centerpiece of every man's work desk and why not preserve the tradition? So what's the update here? There isn't one other than keep tradition alive and give this project a try. It hasn't changed. It's still worthwhile to make and you know what? I'm sure that the people you give it to are going to love it. So guys, links below for this project. Give it a try. Well, one of my very first multi-part build series on the program was my folding chair slash stool. And, um, Honestly, guys, this thing has stood the test of time, both its design and my build. It's been in our kitchen for years. My wife absolutely loves it and uses it constantly. So I don't have anything to add or anything to change about the build. I wouldn't change a thing. Um, the finish that I placed on it, the Verathane's extremely durable, and although the chair has seen its dings and bumps over the years from regular use, its stability and its functionality is still 110%. So, would I build it again if uh, I knew or know now what I knew then and know then what I know now and that sort of thing? 100%. I would definitely build this. And again, if you want to add this to your arsenal of projects, the link is below, guys. Nothing has changed with this one. It's uh, still a spectacular project. Well, here we are partly into the show, and so far it's been nothing but tooting my own horn, saying how great these projects are and how not much has changed. Well, let's look at the opposite end here for this project, and that would be my drill press dust collection bracket that I made quite some time ago. And honestly, guys, um, it never got much use. I built this thing with the hope and the anticipation that it would really ease holding the hose of the drill press to get in there when drilling things like a Forstner bit hole and that sort of thing where there's a lot of chips and a lot of stuff flying off. And honestly, it never really held up. It never really did what I wanted it to do. And although at first it seemed to be a great idea, honestly, I think it failed. And, um, that project has since been removed from the shop. The drill press has been sold, but the uh, dust collection hose holder bracket, whatever you want to call it, has since been burned in the wood stove. So it's really, uh, it, it's real only purpose and it's only good thing that it accomplished is it added a little bit of heat to keep me warm. So they can't all be winners, guys, and they can't all be great projects. I'm not saying that that bracket or that uh, dust collection system wouldn't work for you. It may, but for my use, it just didn't cut it, and I ended up getting rid of it. So there you go. Not every project can be a winner, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to break into a Kenny Rogers song if I keep this up. You know, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to walk away, and on this one... Yeah, I figured it out. I had to run. So guys, there you go. There's the update on the drill press dust collection. Well, the next show on the list that I wanted to touch on was my review of the HEPA filter for my rigid shop vac. And well, you know what, let's, let's head to the shot vac and we'll have a look at it and see how that filter has stood over time of plenty of use. Well, this is still the original filter that I used in that video and it has been cleaned and banged out multiple times and it still 
is rock solid. So we'll just see what we've got here. We have a little bit of dust collection or dust collecting here in the bottom fins of this. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. Some of it is coming out there. But for the most part, the filter is still very much intact. It doesn't seem to hold a lot of dust in between the fins unless you leave it for an extremely uh, extreme amount of time before cleaning it. Now we can see here that there is some dust in there. Well, of course there is. It gets used. But it's just a matter of giving it a little knockout to clean it or a vacuum or blowing it out with an air cleaner. Use a dust mask if you're going to do that, guys. And, you know, for me, another method is hosing it out. And it doesn't take much to get this thing back to being clean and functioning again. I just find that the paper filters, the dust really likes to stick to those ribs. This one here is a different kind of material with a different kind of coating, and it really allows the dust to be released from them very easily and very quickly. So would I recommend this filter now after using it for the years that I have? 100%, I definitely would. And the fact that I've had this same filter for years and not had to replace it, place it, it's actually saved me money because although this was a little more expensive, I would have spent more in replacement filters by now. So HEPA filter recommendation, 100%. If, uh, if you're interested in that, give it a try. I think you'll love it. Well, it was quite some time ago on the show that I brought you guys a fun little project and that was making a wooden spoon. And how does this wooden spoon compare into, say, the ones that you get in the stores? Well, let me just say this. My wife prefers this one over any of the store-bought ones that we have and she keeps asking me to make her more. Uh, it's sturdy. It has really stood the test of time. It has worn and weathered beautifully, and even after years of constant use, it still is better than the ones that the stores provide you with. So, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, sometimes making your own things is better. For the amount of cost that it took for the piece of wood, it's still cheaper than what they charge at the stores and we got a better product project and had a fun afternoon or a couple hours making it. So the update here, again, just bringing it to your attention that this project is, is still valid, it's still useful, and it's still one that you may want to give a try. So there you go, the wooden spoon, give it a whirl. or a spin, or a stir. <laughs> Try it. Okay, so some of you may or may not remember the hand plane restoration that I did. And you may be wondering how this thing fared out over time. Well, Let's go over, get it out of the uh, tool cabinet, and we'll head to the bench, and let's just see how she looks. Well, everything on this plane has remained rock solid since the day I restored it. The only thing here that I'm a little concerned about is that one side here has a very, I don't know if you could even see it, but there is a tiny little bit of surface rust just up along this edge. But I'm not concerned about that. That is nothing more than a little bit of steel wool with some oil and a nice coating of AutoSol metal polish. That same stuff that I told you about earlier in the show. Now guys, this thing has been tried and true and the sole still remains flat. I don't know what to tell you about it other than it's a well uh, it's, it's a project well worth looking into if you've got some old rusty planes and you're interested in restoring them. 
Um, the knob and the tote both have stayed solid. The laminations held together nicely and they're still very comfortable. Both of them have a very nice grip. It's almost kind of custom to my hand the way it fits there. I think I just lucked out on that. But either way, it was a fantastic project. I do have another uh, plane that I will be restoring soon enough. But this one here definitely has stood up. It's gotten plenty of use and I'm glad that I was able to save it from what normally would have been the trash bin. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this week's show. So guys, while some of the updates may not seem important or super fantastic or that sort of thing, what it may end up doing is guiding people who are new to the program to other episodes of the show that may expand their uh, experience levels as far as woodworking goes. And that is what this program is all about, helping those who are learning and new, as well as those who are veterans at it, to try something different. And you know what? There's a lot more to update and we're going to continue that next week with part two of this series of the update show. If there's something that you'd like to know about or need an update about, shoot me a comment below. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I hope you're going to join me next week when I bring you yet another Alternative Tuesday.